thanks for your film. Many thanks to showing us in neighboring scenes. And uh, I will start to, um, to ask you this session of Q&A. And uh, why do you decide to work between fiction and non-fiction in this movie? Did you work with a finished script? Or maybe the story of the film developed with the community as your film? Vou falar sua tradução. É, a gente tinha um ponto de partida que era real. We had a real starting point. É, tinha um menino na aldeia que era o Oko e ele passou por um processo muito parecido com o que passa o Inhaque no filme. A young man from the uh, uh, from the the village and he was going through the same thing that this young man uh, showed. É, então o Oko também era um adolescente de 16 anos que tinha um filho e de repente acreditava que se ficasse na aldeia é, podia morrer por causa de um feitiço. Uh, Oko, the uh, real boy, uh, was a 16-year-old who had a son and he thought that if he stayed in the village he could um, pass away, he, com he could die because of uh, some type of witchcraft. Essa história a gente acompanhou muito de perto, porque enquanto o Oko fugiu para a cidade, a gente estava passando uma temporada longa na aldeia. And we followed up very closely with the story because when he ran away to the city, we spent that's the time that we were spending uh, at the village. Então, esse foi o ponto de partida, é, mas depois é claro que com todas as nossas permanências na aldeia, essa história foi ganhando novos contornos. So that was our starting point, but uh, with all the stories that were going on in the village at the time, that was uh, enabled us to create a little more into the story. E quando a gente decidiu por fim é, filmar o Inhac, and, é, and when we finally decided to film Inhac, é, ele trouxe também todas as, as relações pessoais dele, ou seja, a família dele é a família real dele. He brought in his, uh, his whole network, I mean, the family, this is real family. E cada personagem que a gente acabou filmando trouxe também um pouquinho do seu universo pessoal para o filme. And each one of the characters that we uh, ended up filming them ended up bringing a little bit of their own personal story to the film. I don't know if someone in the audience have some question before I continue. Yes, there. Hello, hi. Uh, first of all, congrats. It's a beautiful film. Um, it's beautiful the way that you guys shot and you guys didn't change the reality. You guys stayed very true to reality because when we usually, when we Google Brazilian tribe, we usually see pictures of very traditional Indians, like their bodies full of paintings and uh, the kokar is very colorful. When today, most of the tribes are very affected by the white people like the scenes you guys had um, playing soccer or p polishing their nails, wearing shorts, t-shirts. So this was beautiful and talking about reality, it would be good if you guys could give an overall of what's going on in Brazil and um, what's the reality for the, the Brazilian tribes with this new president, Bolsonaro, and how endangered they are, what can happen, so this is the first question, and the second one is more about a behind the scenes of how big was the crew and um, what's the biggest challenge of shooting a feature film in a very remote and far area in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you for, <coughs> thank for your question. Uh, um, it's, it's very important, the point that, for us, the point that you underlined, 
um, in, in the Brazilian imagination, in the imaginário, como é que In the imaginário brasileiro. In the collective imaginarium of, of Brazilian people, and, and this is this is uh, a narrative that it's built since the, the Portuguese arrived five centuries ago. Uh, we kept for the Brazilian indigenous a place in the space uh, that it's still in the 15th century or in the 16th century, as if they were frozen. As if, uh, as if it was possible to freeze a culture um, and to make it stay in the same place forever. Uh, we see that even in cinema. Um, sometimes we have this typical narrative of the white man having an adventure in Amazonia, uh, and suddenly he meets an indigenous, and the indigenous comes out of the forest to say two or three prophetic wise words, and then he's back to the, to the deep woods, no? Uh, but uh, the reality is that, for example, the Krao, they are in contact with, with Western culture for uh, more than two centuries. So, of course, when you ask a Krao, um, the people in the city, one day a guy had an idea to have the Krao in the, in the city, um, mascarados, fantasiados, how do you say? Um, wearing costumes. Yeah, but fant fant as if they were in, in, in a costume, a festa de, de costumes, a festa de fantasias. As if they were in a costume feast. Feast uh, to attract tourism to, to the city, which is absurd. I mean, when they go to town, of course, the women dress differently. Um, when white people go to the village for some reason, of course, they dress, they, they dress differently. And for us, it was very important uh, to make a film that does not want to participate in this crystallization of this so-called authenticity, which actually it doesn't exist authenticity. Uh, and it's very problematic when, when a country or a nation wants to be authentic. We know what comes with that, even if it's indigenous, or Americans, or Germans, or Italians, we know what comes with authenticity. So it was very important for us to film the real people the way they are in 2017, the year we shot, we shot the film. Um, so of course it's important for us to, to connect with Yankee, with, with the main character, because uh, just like the other boys and girls of his generation, he's in a way very um, conscious of his culture, of his traditions, of his um, medicine, of, of the way the, the old guys, the shamans, connect with, with spirituality. They don't refuse these things, but of course, they are also uh, in touch with what happens in the city. So the fact that Yankee can use a mobile phone that's not in the film, but now he has a mobile phone, um, or a bike, or, or, or he dresses similar to a boy of the city, doesn't make him be less indigenous as if he was naked as his grand-grandparents in, fi in, in 16th century. So for us it was very important to make a film in this context that it's not pure, it doesn't exist this idea of, of pureness or authenticity. And uh, for the second question, for the crew. Uh, só mais uma coisa, the, just a, a little thing that uh, João didn't say. Uh, right now, with the, this government, uh, these communities are, are really threatened. Um, the the violence uh, towards them is really you can feel much more right now. Even before uh, Bolsonaro won the sec the sec second turn, the second part of the the election, um, uh, people around the farmers who live right around these communities were thinking already that they can do whatever they they want or they believe it's right. So. Um, 
I think uh, never in the history these communities were so threatened like uh, they are right now. They're I don't know. And uh, for the sec uh, for the second uh, question, uh, we had no crew at all because we we have a long relationship with this community, and we ever we didn't feel like we could go there with the crew. We never thought about that. It was just me, Joao, and a friend who w used to work in Funai. He's an anthropologist, but, but now he's married to an indigenous and he lives there. Uh, and he made the sound. Uh, then we have a Krao, uh, Gustavo Chotuk, who was always with us. He's Inyak's best friend. So um, it, was mo it was us most of the time. We shot for nine months, and uh, we shot in 60 millimeters, so it was a huge process to take the material to, uh, to Sao Paulo and then process and see the images. Sometimes it took one month for us to see the images that we shot, um, but it worked really, really fine. That's just the way we, we wanted it to be, I think. Good, e good evening. I had a lot of questions, but I have one particular that I want an answer. That when the main character goes into the uh, the water, does it come out? H how did you how did you do that? <laughs> well, uh, we can reveal the trick. <laughs> There is a trick, <laughs> no problem to reveal the trick. Uh, Yankee is a very strong young boy, so for him it's not impossible to swim under the water out of the, out of the framing. Um, but also there's a curious thing about that sequence because uh, I won't give an answer but because there's no answer but, but I will give back to you the questions that are being made to us during the, the places where we've been screening the film. So very commonly in, in, in Europe, uh, people ask us about a so-called suicide in the end of the film, if it's connected with a certain tendency in, in, in some communities for suicide, especially now with, with the conflict with, with the, the farmers, etc. But in other countries where I think uh, there is still uh, uh, most intense presence of spirituality in, in daily lives, for example, in Peru or even in, in Argentina where we shot the film, and of course in Brazil, uh, people ask us about this encounter in the end of the film. So it's very um, interesting for us as well to see this kind of reactions because um, the film proposes uh, an approach to a different ontology, you know, to a different philosophy, to a different connection with um, humans, animals, trees, vegetables. Uh, they are more or less all on the same level for, for an animist people like the Krao. Um, but still it's common to see, like, uh, is it a suicide, even if we know that there is a trick a film trick the way we did it. One more question, yes. Well, well many questions. <laughs> and <laughs> after that, I'm here. But m at first, there is the first one, and after this one. Uh, hi, uh, thank you for sharing with us uh, the film. Um, I'm curious to know uh, what is the reception uh, the community has had of, of your film? Um, so during the process, the film, th they were watching the film because it was a long process. So we, we shot more or less following the, the chronology of, of the final editing. So we would be discussing especially with, with the closest group, with Yankee, Koto, uh, the images. And 
in the beginning, it was not very clear for them uh, where we were going because after they saw the first sequence of the film edited, they finally started to realize exactly um, this other ritual, which is the ritual of cinema that allows you to connect different pieces and create something else. Um, but the, then Yankee and Koto, they come to the to, to friends for the premiere of the film with us. And of course, it was a very emotional moment. It was the first time they went out of, of, of the village and they go straight to, to a film festival in France. It was very crazy for them. Um, after some days, they, they wanted to come back. Um, but they were, they were very proud to, they realized how important it was to be in that place with a language that is only spoken for, spoken for only 3,500 people. Uh, but finally, after that, we came back to the village and we made a, sc a screening for, for, for the whole community. And um, the father of Yankee, this is the only detail, he is alive, the real father of Yankee. Although the wife, the, 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 the mother, the, the, young, the young boy, they are his real relatives, but the father is alive. So during the shooting, um, people started to realize that he was called Mecaron, the spirit. Uh, so he started to suffer some sort of bullying from the whole community because they would say, you're, you're alive, what are you doing here? You are a Mecaron, but you are alive, what happens? So this started to be some sort of joke in the community during the shooting. So before screening the film, uh, he, ha he asked us to, to make him like a private screening before screening the film to the whole community. And we, of course, we said yes. So he, he came to, to Itacaja. We, we rent a house for some years in this small city outside the village. So he came to our house and we screened the film to him and to, and to Yankee's mother. And it was very, very touching because during the film, he started really to get emotional. Uh, and in the end, he told us, look, I know this is, I, I get your trick. I, I start to understand what's this thing of cinema. I know it's a story. It's, it's not exactly as in real life, but it's very hard for me to see my son alone in the city without me. So he got very emotional uh, projecting or imagining that, that thing. Um, and then th that night after this private screening, we went to village and we screened the film to, to the whole community. And we were kind of stressed because we thought that it would be very emotional for the whole community. But actually the experience of watching the film in a group, in a collective moment, it was like we, all, we realized that we did a comedy because they left for two hours, they left. <laughs> they would laugh, especially the, the kids, they were laughing for things that we, we still don't know exactly <laughs> what's so funny in some moments. I know that sometimes they laugh because they, they would see somebody performing or, and this can be funny, but sometimes they would be laughing for, uh, like um, this moment in the city when Yankee's alone in bed and he looks up and there is this uh, ventilator, or uh, fan. This, this fan. They left about this connection. <laughs> and f for sure there's something funny about that. I think maybe they left in the moments where we proposed weird connections that for us um, coming from this, uh, um, Western tradition, we are very used to some sort of cinematic uh, uh, dispositive, uh, dispositive devices. devices. But for them, it's why the hell are they connected the face with, with the fan? <laughs> so <laughs> we should come back to, to Eisenstein to understand what happened there. But it was a very, very um, nice experience because they they really a, a part of the fact that for them the film is very is a lot f more fu is, is a lot funnier than for us 
but they really enjoy the experience and the, there is a way of, of fighting for the Crow and for other indigenous peoples that comes, uh, that passes, uh, se relaciona com a sedução cultural, não sei como dizer isso. That, that relates a uh, type of like a cultural se seduction. Yeah, the idea that you can uh, fight and struggle with the beauty of your, your culture. So they always told us, yes, please show this film wherever you can show it because it's our culture, our language. We are really proud of the way we are because they are. Um, they are for two centuries in, in a permanent fight with, with the farmers and the, and the missionary, the, the missionaries evangelical, yeah. who try to convert them with the schools that are trying to teach them Portuguese, but they want to, to, to keep their, their language. So, so in, in the end, they, they totally want us to make whatever we can to screen the film. Uh, you almost answered my question already. I have really had two questions. was about the mobilization and how they, if they receive an income from the government or some kind of support, um, how they get money to buy things in the city. Um, um, and also education, um, in terms of schooling, you mentioned schooling in Portuguese. Uh, do they have any kind of written, um, someone who might be um, giving them any kind of education in their own language, or do they have primary education or secondary education? I mean, is there a move for them? Do they want to um, become modernized and educated? A aldeia, é, é, eles recebem uh, os auxílios do governo como qualquer brasileiro é, apto a receber auxílio? The village gets uh, uh, funds from the government as any other citizen from the country could uh, access funds from the government if they need. Como Bolsa Família, é, aposentadoria as uh, a, a family uh, stipend, as uh, retirement. E na aldeia também tem um posto de saúde. And they also have a small um, health services uh, place in the village. Que também é um posto de saúde do estado. And it's also from the state. É claro que aquilo funciona muito mal, porque sequer a saúde brasileira funciona bem nas cidades, quanto mais numa aldeia indígena. Obviously, it works uh, the, the way that uh, health uh, place works is very uh, bad. If you take, for instance, how bad it is in the rest of Brazil overall, much more in a village like that. E esse posto, ainda que tenha sido uma coisa que não foi é realmente solicitada pelos indígenas, o que tem força mesmo na aldeia são os xamãs. And uh, these uh, health places, because they were not something really that the village asked for, uh, what really works best in the village is the shamans. Com a escola acontece a mesma coisa. É, tem uma escola estadual na aldeia, que é para criança desde... De que é seis anos ou pré-primário até o terceiro colegial. In terms of school, it happens pretty much in the same way. The state has uh, schooling from the time they're six years old until high school. Mas é uma escola é, que não está minimamente pensada para funcionar dentro de outro tipo de esquema que não o esquema da cidade ou da do, dos outros, né? Do, dos brancos. But it's not necessarily, it's really not a, at all a school that is actually projected to teach within their culture. It's really uh, a school that is based on, on a white culture. Então eles aprendem é, biologia, eles têm que decorar o que é a mitocôndria, por exemplo. So they learn uh, biology and they have to know what a mitochondria is. 
É, e, e, e o aprendizado da, da comunidade vai sendo deixado de lado e não vai não é, não é valorizado pelos professores que são contratados para dar aula nessa escola. And the learning of the community itself, it's kind of left on the side, sideways. It's actually not valued by the teachers who are hired to teach in that school. Mas agora, pelo menos nessa aldeia, que é a Pedra Branca, está acontecendo um movimento da comunidade em pôr outra forma de ter aula. Então, os alunos estão indo com os professores indígenas para o meio do mato para aprender outras coisas. But at least in this community, Pedra Branca, they uh, are currently having like a, a movement where the the people are actually imposing or requ requesting or uh, that the teachers will adapt to their culture a little more. So the teachers are actually going out into the forest with with the students and learning different things. E os professores brancos estão tendo que se adaptar a esse novo movimento e está sendo um grande problema. And so as the white teachers have to adapt to this movement, this is creating some attrition. Um, uh, more than 50 years ago, maybe before you were born, um, in London we had Survival International, which was working with Funai and Bias Boas, and there were hundreds of tribes. And at the time we felt that they have very different cultures and very different predicaments. And as I watched your film, I thought maybe we all in some way wanted to be in contact with this animist world, but you, you produced the film that did that for me. And I, I, I found remarkable in the film, and we were in Ecuador with the Huarani and the Quechua, but you got so close to the animist soul, you so slowed down the action, it was so plain, that the silence is the opaqueness of the expressions it was like everyone I'd ever met in any tribe. So, I mean, I felt it was an extraordinary accomplishment. But what's happened to Brazil? I mean, in the 80s, I think the president of Brazil produced a constitutional amendment to guarantee indigenous land rights forever. And two or three years later, the next president removed it, and hundreds of co companies applied for a invasion again, for, a, for a gua, garimperos and seringueros and loggers, and all the rest of them wanted to go in. And now we have this monstrosity now just as your generation is, is perfecting, getting close to this thing, another generation of Brazilians have become monsters and, and, and seem to have no feeling about this at all. How can this man get elected with a program like that? What's happened to the Brazilian people? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> we are still trying to understand this. Uh, <laughs> Bolsonaro won the elections, this is the he did an upgrade because Trump won in Facebook and Bolsonaro in WhatsApp. And now they understood how. Uh, in Brazil, there, of course, there is a whole history, but um, most Brazilians don't have money for for a, for a internet, uh, um plan completo de internet for a, for, for a full data plan. For a full data plan. So it and comes with a mobile, the possibility for, I don't know, five dollars per month to have WhatsApp message, and uh, so so you d you cannot even Google something; you just connect with your friends through WhatsApp. And in Itacajá, I could uh, infiltrate me in a group of WhatsApp that was Bolsonaro. In infiltrated in a group that uh, a WhatsApp group that was promoting Bolsonaro with 250 people and basically the the kind of it, it's it's beyond fake news it's things like uh the the left wing candidate is walking and you see a guy with a cuban hat and the message is the cuban paramilitaries are coming to invade us if the left wing win the elections S one other was an image with uma mamadeira com pênis em cima, falando uh, que a esquerda ia inserir isso nas, nas escolas. It was a, a, a baby bottle that on the, on the nipple of it had a, a penis, so they're saying like the schools are going to implement that in, in the public schools. And people, most people believe or want to believe in that. 
but basically it's maybe too early to make a complete diagnosis of, of the whole thing because we are all still very knocked out for for the thing and of course the reaction is starting immediately um, but basically I think that Brazil could never uh, uh, we, we discuss nowadays post-colonialism but it's absurd because Brazil is still a colonialist state in its uh, social structure um, if you go for example to a public institution in Brazil uh, you go to a hospital and the woman or the guy that is cleaning the toilets of the hospital will be black the second person which is maybe a nurse maybe she will be a little less black than that and you go up and then the doctors are white and the 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 director of the hospital is white and blonde like like a german so this structure which in the united states i think it's still present but you are you are making making advances a lot faster than in brazil um, so basically since the arrival of the portuguese people since the invasion uh, this structure serves a few people and these few people are the same families that are in charge of the whole country for years and for centuries uh, so of course the indigenous were always the main uh, enemies of this way of life because of, of this, of this um, invasion because the main question is the land um, and how much profit you can make with the land and for the indigenous there is nothing profitable in the land because they see themselves as part of the land so there is the construction of a narrative that the indigenous are in an earlier stage of, um, of development um, but then you ask Yankee for example he, he came to our house and he said come on you 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 use the toilet and it goes straight to your river this is absurd the fact is that there is only one civilization who wanted to invade and dominate nature and this is the western civilization um, there were t now they say that it's possible around 20 or even 30 million indigenous before the invasion and they had an ecosystem that even with that f those 20 or 30 million people the ecosystem was perfect and still it is inside the indigenous the indigenous land but of course this election was probably some sort of catharsis foi uma espécie de exorcismo exorcism in twitter there was a supporter of bolsonaro who wanted to invite people para a posse do bolsonaro mas em vez de dizer convidos para a posse he said in english for the possession so uh, the, uh, the the way we we it's it's a play on word that wouldn't necessarily translate but inst instead of uh, calling for people to see the inauguration uh, of Bolsonaro, uh, they they he called people to come see the possession in terms of like uh, you know when a spirit possesses uh, Bolsonaro. So, yeah. but the truth is that um, the constitution was made in eighty seven, and uh, the constitution said that the government had has five years to demarcate all the lands. And until now, 30, I don't know how many years before, it's not done. And uh, we, we are still waiting for a government that really cares for the indi indigenous rights, because we didn't have one yet. And of course, there is something. The left-wing project for 15 years, although it had amazing things, and it's true that in Brazil, millions of people went out of the absolute misery level uh, 
schools, hospitals, social programs, of course, we all support all those, those achievements. But the fact is that um, the idea of using the land to produce and produce and produce and produce, it's uh, common to, to, to both left or right wing projects. I mean, the land should be productive. Um, and this is a conflict that will always exist as long as you have a capitalist society putting under sobre o cerco under colocando os povos indígenas sobre o cerco they're kind of like surrounding and, and forcing the indigenous people to follow their paths their ways but as long as we have these absolute different ontologies living in the same place uh, it, it it's imp impossible to work because um, for the indigenous it will always be like that they will never refuse their land their way of life and and the idea that you have to respect animals plants trees spirits uh, all at the same time. I mean, uh, they have a constitution. I mean, it's not written, but their constitution protects us all in the same way. Um, so it's a fight that will that will last. But they are, as Viveiros de Castro says, a Brazilian philosopher, anthropologist, they are specialized in the end of the world subject. We are now discussing all the ecological uh, uh, crises and and, uh, and overpopulation and and uh, but they are specialized in that since the year of of uh, Milutinho. Yeah, since the 1500s, 16th century. They are specialized in that. The last question: Were there? Uh, uh, yeah. So, first of all, oh, sorry, um, congratulate you for such a beautiful film and for being welcome in this community um, and share their story. And I have a million questions, but I guess the most important one is um, if there were, if your actors were somehow compensated and if they're receiving profit from this film. Yes, of course. Uh, it's been a long uh, work for them, and they we we been thinking. In the community, there is an indigenous association, cultural association, who works with the whole community. So uh, we had one part of the money that we gave to this association, and. They, uh, th th everyone who played the character on the film had uh, had his compensation as well. Uh, everything that we do in the Aldeia Pedra Branca, we have to make a big reunion, put all everyone in the patio, you no, know, the center of the village, and talk and explain. And it's been this gather m might take uh, I don't know the whole day, you know, and everyone is talking what they think, what they want to do with the money, if they're going to buy uh, some cows or if they're going to, I don't know, build a little house for something. And uh, we have to be really uh, clear with them in these issues. And it's always been like that. It's not the first time I, w I work in the, in the village. I've been uh, involved in another film uh, in another project, not filming, but uh, some kind of uh, workshops with them, and they have uh, this uh, collective audiovisual. They have. Now they it is for Maron Collective Audiovisual. They have like a, a an audio an AV uh, uh, community uh, committee even uh, that creates collective, no. Um, 
Yes, so they make f they their own films and things, you know, and uh, yes, we didn't have uh, much problem with that because we've been there for 10 years now and we know everyone and we know how it works, so. But it's uh, concerning profit, as you asked, um, the idea of their social and economical organization, it's very sophisticated in a way that it's virtually impossible um, to have profit in the way that it produces accumulation. It's literally impossible. Um, all the social structure, the way families are organized and the way they connect to other families, to other villages. Um, for example, Yankee, wanted to buy the, uh, to bought the motorbike after the film um, with part of his, of his uh, salary, salary? Compensation. compensation so he bought the motorbike to so it's 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 faster for and easier for him to go to to town when he needs to go to town but of course this motorbike um, is a problem for him because uh, it's not his motorbike. The motorbike officially belongs to, particularly to the whole family of Koto, uh, because w when you marry in a Krao village, you, you go and live, as you saw in the film, in the family, in the house of, of, of the, uh, the sua sogra. Yeah, your mother-in-law. Your mother-in-law. Uh, so, of course, all the brothers and cousins and uncles of, of Koto can use that bike whenever they want. So even sometimes we ask Yankee if he can give us a ride to, to Itacajá, to the, to the town, and the bike is not there because somebody took it. So it's a very, very sophisticated system um, that avoids profit and, and uh, accumulation. Uh, even the way that the, the village is, is built you see that maybe in the in the shot of the credits in the beginning, but basically all the the villages of, of the Karao and other other indigenous people from the the Timbira group, it's a group of six or seven ethnies, uh, it's always organized in a circle and all the houses are in this circle and in the center you have some sort of patium, some sort of uh, um, so everybody is living at the same distance from the center. Uh, so the center is, is, is accessible para todo mundo. It's accessible to all of them. And this center is not only geographical, it's social, political, cultural. Um, so whenever money enters into town in, in some way, it 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 dilutes the proper economy informal the the It just dilutes itself in the economy of the village, which okay. is very nice, I think. Thank you so much to you all. Thank you, Joao, Rene, Everton, for translation. It's a great film, and it's in honor that you join us in neighboring scene. Thank you so much, and you are invited for the screen for tomorrow. <laughs>